Good morning, everybody. Amen. How's the family doing this morning? Amen. I'm not like Reggie. I hadn't got 14 pages. I just got one. So maybe you'll get to see the Cowboys today. I'm not sure. <laughs> Woo, I'm up here by myself. Oh, no. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, if you don't mind. Let's just kick it off. Father God, we just want to stop this morning and just say good morning to you. And uh, Father God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit just fills this place this morning. And Father God, speak to each one of us this morning uh, through this message. And Father God, get me out of your way this morning. We just uh, we lift this day up to you, Father God. Just know that we love you, we exalt you, we praise you in your precious, precious name. Amen. Amen. How many of you, I, this is going to be a survey this morning. So how many of you have ever been to a Billy Graham crusade? There you go. There's one. There's two. There's three. Okay. Hey, do me a favor. I'm going to start back here with Jim. Hey, Jim. How did, uh, how come did you go to a Billy Graham crusade? Was you invited? Did you just hear Billy Graham was there? What you, how'd you get there? There you go. That's it. Dad made me go. I like that. Somebody right here. And they took you. So they just said, come on, girl, you're going with us. You had, you had a drug problem. They drug you along. That's, I understand it. Who else? Who else has seen that? There you go. How'd you do that? How, who, how'd you get there? What made you go? Church group. I like that a lot. Somebody over here. I've seen it. Somebody over here raised their hand. Mama. Back here. There it is. How, who made you? What happened? What? Dad made you go. You had a drug problem too, huh? <laughs> All right. Point being. Point being. I want you to hear this this morning. I went to Billy Graham Crusade. And I can tell you that I didn't go because I just knew Billy Graham was going to be there. Somebody invited me, and that's the only way I got to go. Uh, that's the only way I would have went. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, uh, it was an awesome experience. Awesome. Because the, the stadium... I'm, I'm going to call yeah, it was a stadium, it was just filled with the Holy Spirit. It was awesome. Uh, but I was invited uh, by a group. And so today, I hope this message gets through to you uh, that winning people to Christ is not my job, it's yours. It's the way you live, the way you talk the way you do whatever you do. The only God that some people are going to see is going to be through you. The only angel, and listen to this. I'm going to get to some angels in a minute. Who's got their thing, Meducci, going, I do not allow. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Me and Thing Meducci just don't work together. Um, but... Uh, the only angel that, and we're going to, like I said, we're going to talk about angels this morning. The only angel some people are going to see are going to be you. Amen. You believe that? Yes. Absolutely. Do me a favor. So, go to Genesis 19. Reggie preached on Sodom and Gomorrah last week, right? All right, we're going to preach on it again. I like I like Sodom and Gomorrah because it's a it's a pretty cool story and so but there's some things I I love reading the story and I read it several times just trying to get my brain wrapped around this so anyway we're going to start off in in Genesis chapter 19 starting off in verse one okay the two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening now here's the here's the the leading up to this Sodom and Gomorrah had had gone off the deep end I mean God was upset with what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah because all of this, all of the, it was just terrible. And God didn't create people to be terrible. He did not. But we have our own free will. So you can be terrible if you want to. Just don't. 
I have to just help me help you out with that. But anyway, the two angels arrived at Sodom and Gomorrah in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside your servants to your servant's house. You can wash your feet, spend the night, and then go on your way early in the morning. Now, he's letting them know that they can just come, spend the night, eat, and wash their feet, and they can leave in the morning. It's okay. You kind of see this? He's pushing them. All right, understand that. No, they answered. He will spend the night in the square. He insisted strongly that they did, they did go with him and enter into his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking them bread without yeast, and they ate it. Before he had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of, of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. Hear this. All the men of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is all of them. Surrounded the house. And they called out to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, do not do this wicked thing. He says, Look, I have two daughters have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do whatever you want to do with them. But don't do anything to these two men that have come under the protection of my roof. They said, get out of our way. They replied, they said, this, the, fellow, the fellow came here as an alien, and now he wants us to play, now he wants to play the judge. Listen to that. He wants to play the judge. They knew something was going on here. We'll treat, him, we'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled him back into the house and shut the door. Then they, the two men, struck the men, struck the men outside of the door of the house, young and old with blindness, and they said they could not find the door. I find this very interesting. Uh, number one, I want to bring out, there's two men that entered the gates. Now, God sent two angels. Two angels were men. They looked like me and you, two men. But they were angels that God sent. Hear that. The, uh, here's what Lot, I'm not real impressed with Lot. I'm sorry. I'm just not. If you come to my house and I have two angels into my house and they tell me, that they're going to have sex with these angels in the house, and I tell them that I got two daughters inside and they can have my daughters, let me tell you something, that would never happen at the Bramble house. The Bramble house would say, y'all hang on just a minute. I would go into the house and I'd put on my 4 E spurs. I would get Clint's pistols and put them on my hips. I would go back there in the back and I'd get my Marshall Dillon rifle. And I would go back there to my hat rack and I'd put on my Clint Eastwood hat and I'd walk outside and I'd say, go ahead, make my day. You are not touching my daughters. You're not touching these angels. You're not touching nothing in my house. Make my day. You're going to go over my dead body to get in this house, period. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now, here's the other story about Lot. Lot, you can tell by this story right here that Lot was not a perfect man. He was not. Um, here's the thing I will tell you. God will use. God, God had a reason for Lot to come out of that thing. God will use anybody. I don't care what your past is or how bad you think you are. He does not use perfect people in his service. He does not. There was a reason Lot come out of that. If you go ahead and read the rest of the story, it's a crazy story. I'm, I don't mind telling you. There's some weird things that went on after that, and it's okay. Just know that Lot was not perfect, period. When they left, of course, the angels told him, said, you, have you got anybody you want to spare in this place? Now, listen to this. He goes out. Lot says, yes, I got my two uh, son-in-laws to be that are going to be marrying my daughters. 
Let me go talk to them, and I'm going to get them to come with us, okay? So Lot goes and talks to his future son-in-laws, and he says, hey, look, God's going God's to strike this place down tomorrow, and you guys need to come with us, and uh, come on and let's go. And they, they thought he lost his mind. They did. They just, you know, they wouldn't. Now, here's the other thing. If you come, if, if God came to me and sent two angels to my house and said, you need to go tell Tommy that, uh, uh, that tomorrow they're going to they're gonna melt walks the hatchet down, I'd go tell Tommy, say, Tommy, hey, uh, God's going to melt walks the hatchet down. You need to come with me. And Tommy's going to look at me and say, you crazy boy. You, he lost your mind. But Tommy might go with me. I don't know. We might just, I don't know. We, I hope he would. Uh, but I can tell you, I'd, I'd tell Tommy, though. I said, Tommy, I want you to come meet these angels in my house. Here's the thing. If Tommy would have come to my house, it would have been two guys standing there. And he'd say, I thought you told me he was going to meet angels. I said, there they are right there, two guys. You know, they're angels. Tommy said, they're, they're regular people. Uh-huh. We're going to move on to another place. I love this. This is another, another uh, passage that I preached on here a while back. Go to Mark 5, 1 through 7. And this is kind of where it leads into the actual service or the actual uh, message that God has laid on my heart. Mark 5, 1 through 7. I preached on this here a while back. This is Jesus. I'll give you just a second to get there. Everybody good? Going once? Going twice? Everybody's good. Here we go. Jesus coming across the lake to the region of Gerenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came to the, from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with chains, for he often chained... He often chained his hand and foot, and but he tore the chains apart. He broke the arms and on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him night and day among the tombs and in, while he would cry out and then cut himself with stones. Then he saw Jesus from a distance. Here's kind of what I want you to hear this morning. Satan saw Jesus from a distance. I understand that. And when Satan saw Jesus from a distance, he already knew that he was defeated. He knew immediately that he was defeated. There was no doubt in his mind. Now listen, this is what, this is what Satan says to him. He ran and fell on his knees in front of him, and he shouted out with the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Listen to this. What do you want from me, Son of the Most High God? We know that, that God sent him into pigs. They all drowned, and that's good. And they lost a lot of pork that day, and it was good. But here's, here's what I want you to think about this morning. Just Now, this is between you and God. This is don't be punching your husband, and don't be punching your wife, or don't be slapping your kids and say, you need to pay attention. I want you to pay attention because this is just between you and God. I want you to think about asking God this question. What do you want from me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I would start off if I was Jesus and you asked if I'm not ever going to be Jesus. Let me just go back. Let's see. All right, let's go to another place. If you met Jesus on high and you said, what do you want from me, Jesus? Let's go to Matthew 22. And we're going to be in uh, 36 through 40. We're kind of hanging out right in this area right here, so we'll be here for a little bit. Twenty-two, thirty-six 36 through 40. Hmm. I kind of already touched on this already. Jesus would probably look at you and he'd say, I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second, like it is, love your neighbor as yourself. And the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And yet, you got to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, 
your neighbor can... Uh, you talk to so many people in this world, and even in my family, uh, there's always one person, it seems like, in everybody's family that you just can't deal with. You really can't. I mean, it's in, and that happens a lot. And I've got one of those in my family. I love her as much as anybody could love her. I just don't like her. I do. I, I really, I, and you know, and she's going to be in heaven. She really will. But you know what? When she gets to heaven, she will, I will like her again. <laughs> oh. Go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. We'll start right there. Let's everybody get to Ephesians 4 first. All right, and we're going to go to 25. <clears throat> okay, I'm from this part on. Um, think about your life. Think about think about what how how God would. What do you want from me, Lord Jesus? Think about what God would want from you. And this may be what some of it would be. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. But only, now listen to this, but you don't want to let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but do what is helpful for building each other up according to their needs, and it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with God, of God to whom you were sealed for till the day of de redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander among every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to each other, forgiving. For, I, this in my Bible six times. Forgiving. I don't know why it's got to go many signs in there. Forgiving. Others, just as God forgave you. Forgiving. Whoo, baby. That's a tough one, ain't it? Each one of you, listen to this. Each one of you have got a love language of some kind in your body. You may not know it, but you need to learn it. Whatever that language is. One of the love languages might be words of affirmation. What does affirmation mean? Emotional support. Sometimes, where God, wherever God puts you, with whoever he puts you with, sometimes you can't say anything to comfort that person. But sometimes all you need to do is just hold their hand and cry with them. I'm good at that. Uh, I'll tell you, if your eyes leak, your head won't swell. But uh, sometimes that's what it takes, is just being there for somebody in this world, whoever that is. Affirmation. Affirmation. Is encouragement. Nate, you and Amanda, I encourage you to keep to the task. Keep doing what you're doing. And I could encourage so many people in this church to continue on. And I, I don't mean to just pick out them because there are so many people. We just need to encourage them. Nick needs encouragement. Sometimes Buster needs encouragement. Acts of service. Sometimes, whatever 
There's a lot of people got this acts of service in their body built into them. Acts of service. And, I've, and I'm going to tell you about one act of service that I never thought would materialize. I had a friend that asked me to come over and help dig out a sewer line for his daddy. His daddy was 80 years old. He was a, uh, he was a sailor. He cussed like a sailor. He talked to his wife like a sailor. And I'll tell you what, if I was her, I would have slapped him. But I, it would have been a big fight if you'd have done that. But what I can tell you is, I went over there and dug out a sewer line. And when I got ready to leave, he, he said, what can I, he said, how much do I owe you? I said, you don't owe me a thing. I'm just glad to be over here to give you a hand, get your trailer house hooked up to where you got sewer line hooked up. And uh, he didn't understand that. He didn't understand why somebody would come over there and do that. But at that, he decided to come to the cowboy church. At 80 years old, him and his wife both, they met Jesus. Holy smokes. And I'll never forget, he, he told me, he called me, he says, Buster, he says, I'm doing the best I can. He says, but whenever I smash my finger, he says, still bad words come out of my mouth. You cannot correct 80 years of your life in two or three months. It just ain't going to happen when you're that, when you're off that deep end. But here's the other thing too. Getting to heaven, he, 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 lived, he lived three years, four years after that. I don't remember, not very long. I would love to have, I, hope, I would love to see if God made a video of when this 80-year-old cussing person that used God's name in vain in about every sentence that he had got to heaven and seen the beauty of heaven and what changed his life for five years. I would love to see that. I pat myself on the back because we're going to get into this patent thing here in a minute. And I just, I just, because you were going to get into it. I just, we just are, but I helped get him to go to church to lead him to Jesus Christ. That's all I can tell you. But in return, he loved me. He in return helped me with my sermons whenever I preach. He in turn done so much for me. Him and his wife, and, and I loved her with everything I had. She was the sweetest lady after. Anyway, that's kind of where we're going to go with that, and I'm going to leave that alone for just a minute. Now, there's another one that's, that's, that's a affirmation is quality time. I can tell you my wife would love to have more quality time with Buster, but we do as best we could. We, we go put hay out to the cow. She drives the tractor. I cut the hay. We get her done. Another affirmation is physical touch. Not everybody... Not everybody in this world wants you to touch them. They do not. And you need to learn that. If you're a church member here and you're a greeter or whatever, sometimes people just don't want you to touch them. And that's okay. Some people do. They want to be hugged. And I'm good with that. I like that. I'm good with it. And I'll give you a side hug. I'll give you a hug. I don't care. But if you don't want to be touched, I'm going to greet you the same. Get yourself in here. God's got something to say to you today. Gifts. Sometimes it's just a matter of our Samaritan closet, giving some clothes, giving some toys, whatever to somebody. Sometimes it's just baking a pecan pie and taking it to Buster's house. <laughs> Sometimes that's all it is. But gifts, I mean, a act of kindness to somebody else does so much in this world. And let me tell you something. We need acts of kindness in this world today because it has gone to hell in a handbasket. I'm telling you, it has. It just has. Now, we're going to talk about this in Matthew. Let's go ahead and turn there. Let's go ahead and read in Matthew. We're going to go, I told you we're going to kind of hang out here a little bit. Matthew 6. Another one of my favorite verses. I just kind of bust or paraphrase it, but we're going to read it. We're going to read it right out of there. Okay, Ron, it's time. I got to blow my nose. I'm sorry. Okay, good. Tommy. <laughs> oh, Tommy wasn't one said that. Somebody did. Oh, it was you. You ain't right. I'm sorry. 
You just ain't right. That was not any angel. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. We're going to read through verse 4. So anyway, it says, be careful to do your acts of righteousness before... I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets and the hypocrites, like the hypocrites do in the synagogues or the streets, to be, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth. They've been, they received their full reward on earth. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees you, what is done in secret will be rewarded to you. So I'm all about this verse. I love doing stuff, but I'm going to tell you, I don't pat myself on the back. Now, here's the other thing, too. I'm, I'm going to tell you, sometimes, sometimes you can just get PO'd at church, can't you? I mean, you get in church, and, and they, didn't, they didn't do something right, and you just think they didn't do it right. Well, let me tell you something. I, I led the music at, at uh, Big Cowboy Church over here for 13 years, and I pat myself on the back, and I kept that band together, and, and I never let them down, and, 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 and I pat myself on, and I gave so much money to the building fund to help build this church, and yet you want to just fire me as a, as a music minister. The best day of my life. Absolutely. I was broken, bad, broken. I can remember telling God, God, over here at this little building over here, God, I'm coming to church here, but I, I ain't doing this. You're going to find me another church to where I'm going to lead the music because I'm a music minister and I'm going to lead the music by golly and you're going to fix this for me. And what did he do? Made me the associate pastor. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you something about eagles. You need to know about eagles. Eagles, you need to compare yourself to an eagle. Listen to this. An eagle is the only bird that will fly into a hurricane. He is the only bird that will fly into a hurricane. When an eagle has its chicks, he makes the most beautiful nest, and he puts all the straw in there, and he's got everything. And, you know, they, they start off with a lot of twigs and sticks and thorns and all kinds of stuff, and then they put all kinds of neat stuff in there so the chicks will have a comfortable lay, place to lay, and he can keep, and the eagle can keep them warm. But as that eagle grows, the big eagle starts kicking out all the soft stuff to where they're just laying on stickers and thorns and stuff like that that they actually created the nest out of, they do that to get them out of the nest and make them go fly. God put some thorns in my life to get me out of the nest. And that's, sometimes God has to do that to you. And I'm okay with it because let me tell you something, I have been so blessed by being here. You guys bless me, period. Thank you. Okay. All right, so we're going to go to Philippians. Now, one of my, I'm going to just keep giving you some favorite verses. Uh, I wish I'd just printed them all out so you'd have them to take home with you, but we're going to go to Philippians chapter 2. I almost got the There it is. All right. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. Philippians, I'm sorry. I didn't do that right. I did do that right. Philippians 2, 12. We're there. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you and will act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like the stars in the universe. That you may hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ. That I didn't run the race, race for nothing. One of those prayers that my wife and I generally do every morning, generally. There's some mornings we just, for some reason, we get, don't get there, but most times we do. 
is help me to be a light today that shines in this dark and depraved world. Help me shine today. Because that, you're going to, you're going to win more people to Christ by your lifestyle than you will if you go to them and you say, hey, look, Jesus is coming tomorrow. I need you to come meet Jesus today because they're not going to do it. The only way they're going to get to meet Jesus is through your life. Sometimes the only angel they're going to see is through you. Sometimes the only God is going to be through you. So live your life accordingly as God would have you. And, and here's the other thing about living this life is it's not a, it's not a game. It's a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle of how you live your life. And let me tell you something. There is no way that I, my refrigerator went out this week. That, that's a bucket. And I'm not going to go with the rest of that. It's just buckets. My refrigerator went out. And it's a built-in refrigerator. It's four, four foot wide. And, 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 and I've tried three compressors and I still hadn't got it fixed. And then I found out there's a leak inside the refrigerator, which I'm not going to try to fix. So we're going to buy a new refrigerator. $18,000? No, I can't do that. <laughs> We're going to go buy another used refrigerator today. <laughs> but here's the thing. Sub-Zero, yeah, it, I'm not kidding. This, I'm serious. This stuff is expensive. I, did, I, I, I didn't know we was rich like that to have that much of a refrigerator in our house. Uh -uh, no, I didn't know that. Um, here's the thing. I never got upset about it at all whatsoever. Because when I got up in the morning, I just went out to the refrigerator outside and got some ice out of the ice chest. And we put it in the ice chest. And... And my ice cream, we had to take my ice cream because we got to have ice cream, right, Tommy? We got to have ice cream. It's, it's an important thing to have ice cream at that time. I took it outside and put it in the other refrigerator. I never got upset. I never cried. And, and the first compressor I put, a, put on didn't work. Second compressor I put on didn't work. Third compressor I put on didn't work. And we spent almost $1,000 on compressors, and it still doesn't work. Let me tell you something. I never got upset. I just smiled. God's got this. I, I, you know what? I am not worried about it at all whatsoever. All right. Shining like stars in the universe. Tomorrow morning when you get up, you're going to pray that prayer. Please. Shine. I want to shine today. All, right, I'm, all I'm trying to do is get you guys equipped to win Jesus people to Jesus Christ through your actions and your lifestyle. And if it means being like Kevin back there in the back, if it takes... Learning how to change your language, that's okay. If it takes learning how to change your friends, that's okay. Because if you have to change your friends due to their lifestyle, you'll get new ones that fit your lifestyle, and God will lead them to you. So you got that. All right. Um, here we go. Uh, let's go to Matthew again. I'm, I'm telling you, I like Matthew a lot. So let's just go back to Matthew, if you don't mind. Let's go to 25. I told you we was talking about heaven, or singing about, Nick sang some songs about love and heaven and da-da-da, and, and uh, we just had a lot of heaven songs this morning, and that, what a blessing. Uh, because at the end of this journey and this lifetime, guess where I get to go? Absolutely. Absolutely. 25, 31, 31. Hmm. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on the throne in, the heavenly, in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the, and the goats on his left. And the king will say to to those on his right hand, come, ye who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. The kingdom was prepared for you since the creation of time. For I was, now listen to this. I, I've, I'm, I've talked about the acts of love languages here this morning. Listen to this. And this is what Jesus will say. Do me a favor. Change your lifestyle. If I'm, if I'm talking, if God's speaking to you this morning, change your lifestyle tomorrow, starting tomorrow morning, starting today. Change your lifestyle. Because this is what you may hear when you meet Jesus. He says, for I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. 
I was sick and you look after me. I was in prison and you came and spent some time with me. That's what I want to hear. When I get to heaven. I wrote, made some notes of what do I need help with? So if any of these hit your uncomfort zone, fix it. What do I need help with? I may need help with my language. This is a big one. I, need, I may need help spending time with the Lord. I may need help loving others. I may need help having quality time with my family. I may need help forgiving others. Maybe I need help to just forgive myself. Here's another big one here for guys, girls, whatever. I may need help with unwholesome thoughts. Go back to Philippians. Back and forth. Here we go. Bible, Bible drill this morning. Starting off verse Chapter 3, verse 12. Okay, everybody's changing their life. Okay, here we go. Listen to this. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bear with each other, and forgive whatever grievance you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Over all these virtues, Nick sang about love this morning. Over all these virtues, put on love. Wow. That may be fun tomorrow when you go to work, isn't it? Because that guy that's been bugging you, put on some love. Show him a little love. Bind them with all in perfect uni unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart since members of one body you are called to peace. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in, your richly, in you richly as you each and admonish one another with wisdom. As you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude and level of your heart and whatever you do, Whenever, when, whether in word or in deed, do all in the name. Do, listen to this. Do all of it in the name of Lord Jesus. So it's, you know, when you're doing something for somebody else, it's not you. Can you just change your thought process? This is not you doing this for them. It's Jesus Christ living through you doing it for them. Here's the question. What do you want from me, Lord Jesus, Son of the Most High? What do you want from me? One thing we need to do is be ready for Jesus' return. Because I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going to say it again, this world is going to hell in a handbasket, period. We need to be ready for the return of the Lord Jesus. And the other thing, too, is you don't know when your ticket gets pulled. And he says, Buster, it's time. Because God didn't give us a heaven elevator that says, okay, Buster, on July the 31st, you need to go up there and get in that elevator because you're going to heaven that day. He did not tell me that because it would be tough. He pulls your ticket when it's time for you to come home. And when God, when God pulls your ticket, you're not going to be able to hide. You can't go in the closet and hide from him. He's going to pull your ticket. And here's the la and so we we sang about heaven and and so listen to this, church members, listen to this. Jesus says, "Behold, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. And in my Father's house, there are many rooms, many mansions." And if it were not so, I wouldn't have told you that. 
But if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back and get you. I'm all about that. No matter what happens to Buster today, when God pulls my ticket, he will send some bad angels to come get me because I'm bad sometimes. Now, he'll send some great angels to come and get me. Matthew 20, 24, 36 through 44 says, No one knows the day or the hour when Christ is going to come back. And I'm going to tell you, through the generations, there's been a lot of people that stood up here in the pulpit and said, People, this world is going to hell in the handbasket, and it's going to end. This probably started back in the 1800s, whenever they was preaching hell and damnation and fire. But the world is going to hell in the handbasket, and so all I'm asking you to do is to be ready. If you're ready, when God pulls your ticket, that will be a great day, and I can't wait to see the smile. On your face when we get to heaven. We sang about that song this morning. It says, All of our loved ones that have gone before us are there waiting on us if they're a Christian. And that's uh, much I'll tell you is if you have somebody in your life, in somebody in your family, somebody that you're friends with that don't know Jesus, maybe the change in your life, you invite them to our Christmas program to hear. The Christmas program. Maybe you invite them to our cowboy church here to hear the word of God. Maybe you just bring them here. If you can get here and live through the music, which I can, uh, I, a lot of people will tell me the music brought me to your church, but God changed me. And that's what we want to do. We want to get the people here. It's not your job to change them. It is not your job to change them. That's God's job. Turn it over to him. You cannot do it, but you can sure get them here. That's all you got to do is just get them here and let God do what God does best. And that's what I do sometimes. Sometimes I'll just say, God, they're walking through the door right now. It's your job now. I got them here. <laughs> sometimes that's what it takes. Let me ask you this. Let me share one more thing with you before we close today. Luke 9. Just, I'm going to just say this, 926, if you want to go there, you can. This is my, one of my favorite verses. This is, this is the way I share with people to get through stuff that they're hanging on to. Uh, you know, I, we, we dealt with a lot of kids, but my, my mother and daddy Trump is so bad, and I just can't do it, and I'm, I can't do it, and they, it's all their fault that they did this, and I can't do it, and, and it's their fault. It's not, listen to me. Here's what God says. No one who puts his hand to the plow and look back. It says no one who puts his hand to the plow. This is God asking you to hook onto the plow. He says don't look back. No one that hooks to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And that's what I tell people. Put your hands to the plow. Don't you ever look back. But what I want you to do is look forward. And all I want you to do is look at what you hadn't plowed yet and figure it out. Hook your hands to the plow and go. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, we do just want to stop this morning, and I just thank you for this message, Father God, and I just pray that somehow this touched somebody's life this morning, and Father God, help us just to be more like you, Father God. I pray that each prayer in this building today is, Father God, Son of God, what do you want from me today? Amen.